Hey, so before we get into it this morning, I just need to say this first. Kids, do not try this at home. All right, so officially I put it out there because what I'm about to tell you could get you in trouble if you do this at home. So this is like one of my favorite times of the, of the year. Um, as a kid especially, this like week leading up to Halloween, because Halloween was always fun and great, all the bushels of candy. Um, but the week prior to Halloween was honestly one of my favorite times of the year because in my little world, in my neighborhood, that was soaping and corning season. Okay, how many of y'all know soaping and corning? How many of you have been soaping and corning? Fellow criminals, good to have you here with us. Glad, glad you're here. We need more sinners in the church. Hey, so, so if you're not familiar with soaping and corning, let me tell you what it was, um, but I know you won't do it at home yourselves. So we'll start with corning. It's the easier of the two and the less illegal. So corning, about this time of year, you know, the garden would dry out and our, our, we had a big garden, lived out in the country and, and the shocks, stalks of corn would, would, you know, still have corn on them. So as kids, we'd go into the gardens and we'd grab all the corn we could and then we'd just twist it in your hand, takes all those golden kernels off and they're hard, they're brittle. And you take a, a, a paper bag, a grocery store paper bag back in the day before we had plastic bags, right? So you had a big paper bag, and we'd start this in September, so by the time you got to mid-October, you had like three quarters of a bag full from getting all the kernels off the cobs of, of this just great corn. And then you'd, you'd, that would be your corn for the season, for the week or two that you had to go corning. So you set that aside, hold on to the corn, we'll get to it in a moment. Soaping. Soaping is a little more risky, a little more dangerous, a little more scientific, because you had to have the right soap. Right? There are different kinds of soap, and this is before pump soap, so everybody had bars of soap. And so what we did as kids, we'd all go to our mom's like, soap stash, and we'd test all the soap on our own windows to see what the best one was. Like, you take like, 13 bars of soap, and this one's not good, this one's good. You know, like Castile soap, not good, too hard, doesn't even mark. Um, those little decorative soaps, terrible, they don't do anything. But hands down, the best bar of soap for soaping windows... Ivory, right? Ivory soap. Everybody, every service, we'd be like, yeah, ivory. Like a whole bunch of hula hands in here, right? <laughs> so ivory soap, it's just soft enough to leave a good mark and hard enough to last the whole season. So now you got your soap, you got your corn, and, and the idea is to go as stealth-like as possible through the neighborhood soaping and corning houses. And so you put on your, your darkest pants, uh, your, your darkest chucks, you put on your darkest coat. Maybe if, if you're really all in, you're going ski mask. Right, you don't want anyone to know it's you if they do have to look out and see you out their window. So we would go um, get out in my front yard, myself and three or four other friends. W which road do you want to do? Benbrook, Brandon, Sunset. Let's go Sunset tonight. Right? Sunset Drive. So we're going Sunset Drive. And, and you start by soaping, right? Because you've got to be stealthy. You, and you walk up to the window and you can just like make a mark. You can draw a picture. You can like write your friends like Jamie was here. You know, get them in trouble, throw them off your scent. But the best way was caking. You just cover the window so thick with the entire thing, they can't see out. And that was the most risky because you're there longer at their window and you're pressing harder. Uh, and if you're going to get caught, it's usually when you're caking. But man, if you cake the window, you get high fives all the way to the next house. It was, it was, the, the, it was the deal. So then once you've soaked and you're, you're satisfied, you've, you've soaked them well enough, then you step back a little bit, bag of corn, reach in, big handful, start hurling it as hard as you can, you know, drrr, all over the windows, soaping and corning. And some of you are like, Rich, you, you, are you sure you're a pastor? I assure you, after both the previous services last night and this morning, I've had people come and say, man, you, we did way worse than you. I feel good about myself telling you this story now. I, I came in feeling a little iffy, but I feel pretty good now because people are telling me what they did to houses. I mean, like, I didn't go that far. But soaping and corning, like we had some rules in our neighborhood. You never, ever, ever soap anyone's house that can't get out and clean their windows. So the elderly or people who just had some challenges, you, you didn't soap. You, these houses are off limits. And the other rule was never, never, ever get caught, Right? <laughs> You've got to make sure you don't get caught. Because you get caught, you're going to squeal on your whole team. Then your whole team's in trouble. So soaping and, 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 and um, corning. And it wasn't malicious. Like we soaped our friends' houses the worst. Like b before you went to the door and knocked, say, hey, you want to come out soaping? You soap their windows first. Then you knock on the door. You want to go out soaping. And, and, and by the way, our neighborhood, 
cleanest windows come spring in any neighborhood around, right? It was, it was just a given. But that, that, was, that was soaping and, and corning. And the object of it is, is to get up close and personal right where people live. Like you're getting in their yard. You're going to their back door. You're getting on their front porch. You're getting right up, right up close and personal with them so that you can make your mark. Not unlike those of us who are followers of Jesus, what we're supposed to be doing with our faith and with our lives. We are supposed, as followers of Jesus, we've been looking at this for six weeks. This is week number seven, our final week. We are supposed to be getting up close and personal, right, in, into people's lives, into the, into the side yards of their lives, the back doors of their lives, the front porches of their lives, getting up close and personal with them so we can make our mark on them. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Today, we're going to talk about that a little bit further. Welcome into our final week of our fall mission vision series called Make Your Mark. We believe that God uh, really has this absolutely amazing message for every person and, and of every time and of every place, this message that he loves them and he wants them to be in relationship with them. And God has called us as his people to take their lives with that message. He wants us to carry that message into them. What we've been discovering is that God wants to make his mark on your life and he wants to make his mark on others through your life. Like he looks at you and he knows how you're living. He knows what sin has done to you. He knows what the world has marked your life with. Things like you know, fear and anger and frustration and worry. All those things that, that, that the world leaves on your life. And God's like, you can do better. I can remove those. I put my mark on you instead. Stuff like peace and hope and power and love and life and joy. And when he does that, when you cry out and say, God, I need you. And God puts his mark on you. Then the expectation is you go out and you start putting your mark on other people. You, you begin to, to share with others what God has done in you. And so that's what we've been talking about for six weeks. Again, this is our final week talking about how to make your mark. Now, if you're brand new with us, like, great, I came in the very last message of a message series. Listen, we're just super glad you're here. Um, and, and maybe you've not even made a decision yet. You're, you're still weighing out your options to follow Jesus, not follow Jesus we want you to know that you're okay right where you are right now. You just come in as you are. We all started where you are. There's no expectation. There's no test for you. We just hope you'll let us come alongside of you and get close enough to you that we can pour into you what we've learned about this amazing Savior whose name is Jesus. Again, this is what God calls his people to, um, to pour into people's lives like this. Uh, we would help, like to walk with you in that journey you're starting maybe even today. Uh, so, so here we are with this final message, and we're talking today about launch. Launch is when God sends you into ministry. Like once you're His, and you're growing in Him, and you're learning about Him, and okay, God, what do I do? Well, I'm going to send you into ministry. But it doesn't stop there, because when God launches you into ministry, he expects you to be then be pouring yourself into others so you can launch them into ministry too. And today we're going to look at two events from Scripture that show us that that is our job description as followers of Jesus to be launched and then to launch others into ministry. These two Scriptures are going to speak to that for us. So let's get into, into the first one. Um, this is, you know, this first one, this is if, if Jesus could take everything He taught and everything He did about how to live your life as a follower. If he could say, hey, once you're mine, now this is what I want you to do. He took all of that and bundled it up and packaged it and handed it to, to you. It would be in this next couple of verses. This is like the package that Jesus would hand to you. So if you want to follow along, open your Bible, tap on your Bible app, or for this first event, it's actually going to be on screen for you. This is Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. This is what Jesus said. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So picture this. Here's Jesus standing with his followers. It's one of the last times he gets to address them. And he says, I want you to understand that all authority, not just some authority, but all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And if I was standing there as one of them, I would say, I believe it. Because they saw him do miracles. They saw him uh, get arrested. They saw him killed. They saw him buried. And now he's standing here alive talking to them. I'm with him, right? 
Anybody that can do that and tell you it's going to happen and actually pull it off, you go with them. I mean, he says, hey, all authority has been given to me. Yeah, apparently so, because you just beat death, and no one's ever done it like that before. So Jesus is telling them, hey, there's no power in anyone or anything more powerful than me. I have all of the authority. Then he says this, verse 19. Therefore, like, because I have all authority, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So in church world, this is known as the Great Commission. This is where Jesus just co-missioned us with him. Like, you all have known me. You've been with me for some years. You know what I'm doing, what I'm about. That's my mission. I'm now inviting you into the mission. Go get the job done. He just handed the church our mission. And there are four verbs in this mission that we need to understand so we see how he is launching. First of all, he's launching us into ministry And then we'll talk about us launching others. So there are four verbs in this great commission or the mission Jesus gave us that we need to get. So here's the first one. It's go. He says go. Like you can't just join together on on a Sunday morning and huddle and cuddle and say that was good enough. Like this cannot be the highlight of the practice of our faith. See, Jesus' command to his people is to go. Uh, a, A better translation from the original language would be as you are going. And that was just the way they said, as you're living your life. Like, as you go about doing your normal stuff, as you are going, be doing this. So as you are going, uh, not just the one hour a week you're in here, but the 167 other hours of the week that you're at your home, at the job, in your school, on the field, on the bike trail, wherever you are, as you are going, that leads us to the next verb, make. Like, make disciples. Again, a better rendering from the original language is, as you are going, be making disciples. It's an ongoing process. It's continuous where you are actively working. Listen, when you make something, you're not sitting back hoping it's just going to do it on its own. You are stepping in, and you're getting your hands on it, and you're moving it, and you're working it, and you're shaping it, and you're forming it. You are making something. That's what Jesus said. This is active. This is you and me as followers of Jesus getting our hands in the lives of people and making them into disciples. As you are going, be continuously making disciples, working in their lives to lead them to Jesus. Third verb, baptize. Doesn't mean you're going around with fresh water, just sprinkling it on people wherever you go. Baptize, is, he's talking about leading people to faith. When you, that's what baptism is, right? Baptism is this outward expression, this outward sign, the fact that I've given my life to Jesus. When I give my life to Jesus, I proclaim it to the world. As a believer, I'm announcing I follow Jesus Christ. So when he says, hey, go baptize them, means lead them into faith. Make sure they surrender their lives to me. So go, make them disciples, celebrate it with them by baptizing them. And fourth, the fourth verb is teach. Like once, once they've given their lives to Christ, man, you got to keep growing them. You keep pouring your life into them. That's what Jesus has done for us. That's what he's telling us to go do now for others. Take everything that Jesus has given you and you give it into the lives of others. You invest in them, teaching them. Remember, like way back, one of the very first sermons in this series, we looked at the book of Hebrews And the writer of the Hebrews was just so snarky with his readers. Remember what he said? He said, by now, you should be teaching others, but you're just a bunch of big babies. That's what we were saying to them. You should be teaching others by now, but all you've done is huddled and cuddled the whole time and done nothing with what God's poured into you, and he was chastising them for that. We're supposed to be teachers of others. You can't just say, I'm a follower of Jesus, so I go to church, period. You've got to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, so I go teach others about Jesus. This is what Jesus is telling us um, who are followers of him. So go make, baptize, teach. This is you 
being launched. Jesus commands this of you if you're a, a follower of His. But then what? Like you go out, you're getting close to people's lives, you're raising them up, you're, you're making, you're shaping, forming them into believers, you're, you're pouring into them, you're investing into them. But what do you do next? You then launch them into ministry. You mentor them and then you release them into what God has called them to go do as well. It, it's, it's where you're pouring into them what Jesus poured into you, then they go pour it into others. So whether you are the person being launched or the one who is doing the launching, let's t- like, take a look now at another event from the life of Jesus where he shows us what it's like to launch people into ministry. So this next event happened sometime in that three-year span of Jesus' ministry. And maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, hmm, I didn't know Jesus was in ministry for three years. Listen, when you walk in here, we do not expect you to know anything or everything. You just walk in again. You start where you are. There's, there's no level we hold you to. We want you to know that you can come in here and not know anything, and, and, and that's okay. Again, just let us, let us come into your life and pour into you what we do know, and we'll, we'll learn even more together. So here's Jesus. He's partway through his three-year ministry, and just think about that for a minute. Three years. You know what Jesus did in three years? He changed the world. He clarified the past. He, he carved out the future in three years. What, what have you done the last three years of your life? That's humbling, isn't it? I don't know. I got up and went to work every day. My kids are okay, I think. You know, think about it. In, in three years, Jesus changed the world. And here we are 2,000 years later. He's still changing lives. This is, this is Jesus uh, doing what Jesus does. He does it all by loving, leading, and launching. And, and let's, So let's see what that launching now looks like. This is not going to be on screen. So again, if you've got your Bibles, open them up or just tap your app. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. I won't read it all. We'll walk through it. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. Luke writes these words for us. The Lord Jesus appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He appointed 72 others. Did you know that Jesus had other people around him besides the 12 apostles? Jesus had like sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of people around him. Some of them were just curious, but there was a big group of them that were committed And when you read in Scripture, the word disciples oftentimes is talking about not just the 12 apostles, but this other group that were thoroughly committed to Jesus as his disciples. So let's talk about what a disciple is so we help uh, clarify that. A disciple uh, back in that day was anybody who would attach themselves to a rabbi to learn what the rabbi knew, but more importantly, to do what the rabbi did. So if, if, if you're a rabbi, you would get people around you that you think could not only have the capacity to learn what you knew, but could also live the life that you're supposed to live. So a rabbi, for a rabbi, success meant succession. Success meant succession. I'm going to pour into you, but now you become like a little me, like a mini me. But then you go out and do the same for others, so I've just replicated myself all these times out there through you, through them, through others, over and over and over again. Success equals succession. Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus had had these disciples, and he was sending them out to do the work that he had already begun uh, to do. Now, in this case, he sent them out uh, as almost like a test run to go to places where he was about to go. So Jesus sends out these 72. We don't know how he chose them, why he chose them, but he's been pouring into them. Obviously, they're the ones that he wants to send, and he sends them out in groups of of two to all these different towns. Think about that for a moment. 72 people in groups of two. You can do the math. That's 36 towns. 36 towns. How many of you have ever gone uh, to a concert 
Like if your favorite group, don't have to tell me what it, what, what it is, because you know, we'll probably have to talk with Jesus later about it. But you, you've gone out like to your favorite you know, music group, and you bought the shirt because in the back, all the towns are listed, right? And yours is right there. Right? I was at that one, and you, you know, put a mark by, that was my town. This, this was a tour. Like Jesus, I am going out on tour. Y'all go get this, the, the places ready. You go before me. And, and uh, we're going to hit 36, maybe even more, because he said, hey, if that town does not receive you, shake the dust off your sandals, go to another one. So maybe even more, but they could have had the shirts made. They could have been wearing new. Hey, we went to all these places, and that was the town I went to, preparing them for Jesus. So, so here's what's happening. He sends these, 30, these 72 people out. They go to all these towns and listen to how Jesus describes it. Now, verse 2, Jesus told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So Jesus, get this, Jesus is sending them where the church is not yet established. They didn't go to any of these towns and go to first church wherever and go to worship with them, have potluck afterwards and say, Woo, I'm so glad y'all were here, you got things covered. Jesus is coming to speak to all the believers. They were going into places where there may not have been any believers. That's why Jesus said, hey, the harvest is, is, is man, it's bountiful. There are so many people in these areas I'm sending you that don't yet know me. They have no relationship with God through me. He sends them to where the, 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 they had to have no, maybe no believers at all. And some of you know what that's like. You live there every day. Like, you're the only believer in your home. Or you're one of the only believers in your workplace. Or you're one of the only believers, like if you're a student, I mean, your school, that's a mission field, right? The, 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 it's ripe for harvest in your schools. And let's not forget, church, that's our community. All the communities around us, we are living with a vast majority of people around us are not church people. They're not followers of Jesus. We're the minority by far. So we just need to understand that. And that gives us launch point number three. Some of you are like, wait, what happened to one and two? It's a launch. I'm counting backwards. Do you see what I did there? Right? So here's launch point. It's your first one to fill in, but it's launch point number three. Here it is. Jesus launches you where people need him. Jesus launches you where people need him. Listen, Jesus says, hey, go be the light of the world. What good does it do if you take your light into a brightly lit room? Nothing, right? But when you go into a dark place, where you go where there isn't a light, man, that's where you shine so brightly. That's what Jesus is doing. He's launching you into places where people don't know him, where people need him. And when he says, he says, hey, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, that tells us something. We don't have a harvest problem. We've got a worker problem, right? He says, hey, while you 72 are going out, you'd be praying that God would send more because they're so ripe. There's so many people that need to know me that we need even more, more, more workers. This was, again, this is what Jesus trying to get across to us. The harvest is ready. And if we're just sitting in here huddling and cuddling, they're withering on the vines. We can do better. We have to do better. Let's keep, let's keep going. Let's see what else he says. Verse 3. He says, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. And every person in the crowd would have shuddered because they knew what happened when wolves and lambs got together. There probably wasn't a person in the crowd who didn't have uh, a dad or a brother or or an uncle or a cousin that wasn't a shepherd. Like they, they all were connected somehow in their life to a shepherd in that culture. It was probably Uncle Leo's favorite thing to do around the campfire was tell all the kids, hey, one time my my lambs got in with some wolves. Let me tell you what happened. And the kids didn't sleep all night for three nights, right? They understood what happens when a lamb and a wolf get together. And Jesus said, hey, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. So back in the day when we used to go soaping and corning, which is so much not as bad as I thought it was after... I talked to some of people. Um, we, there was always one house that was the scariest house for us. Like, if, if, it was my neighbor, and if we soaked his house like one night, we never did it two nights in a row, because once we started, he hid, waiting for us to come back. 
Seriously, Mr. Gray. And Mr. Gray, when we were kids, Mr. Gray was old. I mean, 35-ish. And, and, he, was, and he, he honestly would wait for us to come back, and he would run out chasing us. And so, on, so if we knew that he was there, uh, we, we, would, we would go way out around the back 40 of his property, around his house, to get to the rest of the houses on Sunset Drive. We never knew exactly what he would do if he caught us, but we knew the rumors. Rumors were that he tied you up in chains. <laughs> but you know why that rumor started? Because when he came out of the bushes, he always had a chain. And he was like rattling and he'd come running out with chains in his hands. Like, we were freaked out by him. Um, the, another rumor was he would call the cops and you went to jail for at least two weeks. But the, the worst rumor of all, and I honestly, I honestly believe this, that if Mr. Gray caught you, he would hold you as prisoner in his garage, it, not just that night, but maybe the next night also. And I honestly went looking in the windows of his garage. Every time I soaped his house, I would always go to his garage and look to see if any of my friends needed rescuing, <laughs> right? God, I'm so afraid they were going to be in there for who knows, like, how long has it been since you've eaten, right? Uh, you know, I never found anyone, thank goodness. Uh, no one from my crew ever got caught. Uh, and it didn't even matter that uh, his oldest daughter was our babysitter, right? <laughs> His youngest daughter was our age and one of our friends. Didn't matter that he and his wife, Leanna, they, they hung out socially with our parents. If he caught you, you were dead meat. So no one from my crew got caught, but a friend of mine from another group one night got caught because all the neighbor, all just these different groups went out soap and corn him. And his name was Little Lloyd. His dad was Big Lloyd. We lived in the country, all right? So Little Lloyd got caught. And Little Lloyd's family were their best friends with the Grays. Didn't matter, because the report that got back to the rest of us around the neighborhood was little Lloyd got caught, and Mr. Gray made him wash his mouth out with his own soap. <laughs> no lie. We were scared to death. That, it was dangerous going to Mr. Gray's house, because Mr. Gray waited for us, and you knew you're walking into it. When Jesus sends out people, you and me, into the lives of people who need him, you're walking into dangerous situations. You're walking into people who have broken lives and broken relationships and shattered dreams and shattered jobs. And that's not easy stuff. And sometimes when you go out to, to witness for Jesus, you're walking into the stronghold of the enemy where he's waiting for you with things way worse than chains and an idea about yourself. He's waiting for you out there. You're going out as lambs among wolves. And so here's launch point number two. Jesus launches you where it's dangerous. And you just need to know that going in. It's, he's not saying, hey, weigh it out. If it's too dangerous, don't go. He's saying, hey, you're going. But just beware. It's going to be risky when you're out there. So he, he sends us out even though it's dangerous. Let's keep going. Jesus gave them instructions about what to do. He tells them like what to expect, how to handle it. Some people will receive you. Some towns will reject you. If they reject you, shake the dust off your feet, keep going to their town. So he tells them all that. And then at some point, they come back to Jesus and report to him what happened. So jump down to verse 17 and, and listen to this. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And friends, those closing verses, they give us launch point number one, three, two, one. Here's the last one. Jesus launches you in his authority. Jesus launches you in his authority. Let me ask you something. How absolutely reassuring is that? When you know you're going out where people need him, where you know that where you're going out is dangerous, you're going out like a lamb to wolves. Don't you want to know that when you're doing that, that you're going out there under the authority and in the authority of someone bigger, badder than you are. Isn't it great to know that when you as a lamb are going to face the wolves, you're going in the authority of someone who is bigger than the big bad wolves. 
Isn't it great to know and reassuring to know that when Jesus sends you out, he doesn't leave you to your own power, doesn't leave you to your own devices, doesn't leave you to your minuscule authority. He says, you go in my name and you go for my glory and you go with my agenda. You do my will, my way for my glory and you're under my authority and nothing will harm you. Doesn't mean that, that it's not, that it's not going to be hard. Doesn't mean it's not going to be dangerous, but you go under the authority of the one who has authority of everything in heaven and on earth. So friends, the bottom line is this. Jesus trusted his church with his mission in the world. Go make disciples. This is our job as his followers. Collectively, it's our job as this church, community church, we're supposed to be growing you up and equipping you and launching you to go out into the world. But it's your job as an individual follower of Jesus to do the same for other people. You begin to mentor them and pour yourself into them and invest your life into them and make them into disciples. Bring them into your home. Walk through the scriptures with them. Pray with them. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. You, you grow them. Whatever pace, remember, take their time. Whatever time it takes. But when you know they're ready, you release them. And you say, go. We've prayed for weeks about what God's calling you to. You're ready. Go. People out there need Jesus. Go. It's dangerous out there. But go under his authority. Go. And so you become a launch pad for other people to go out and lead more people to Jesus. Remember, success equals succession. Disciples making disciples, making disciples, making disciples. Launch. Launch. Let me ask you a question. Who are you pouring into? If your answer is nobody, that can change. And it needs to change. As a follower of Jesus, you must, you should be pouring into others. Who are you developing and growing to launch them for Jesus? Friends, this is how we follow Jesus and lead others to Him. This is changing lives. And this will change the world. So let me tell you for the last time, go make your 